Thank you, Catherine. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Special welcome to our speaker, Mark Meyer and Chevon Lee. Chevon, nice to see you. I'm sorry we are not able to do this in person. It turns out the storm wasn't as bad as everyone predicted, but the university canceled classes, so we switched to an online uh, format. <clears throat> Mark and I go back a very long time. Uh, too long, in fact, to... Uh, uh, to admit, but uh, Mark is, you know, one of the people who really have built <clears throat> the Damore McKim School of Business and the entrepreneurship program at Northeastern University. He's really the energy behind it, the idea, all the ideas behind it, and the uh, person who saw it through and, you know, brought in lots of other people uh, to help build and scale it up. So very, very happy to have Mark back. He's the uh, Robert Shulman Professor of Entrepreneurship and Matthews Distinguished uh, Professor at Northeastern University. Uh, he was for a number of years the head of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group and helped to build it uh, to what it has become. Before that, we were all actually in the same department. It was called General Management. And uh, it's always been me great pleasure always to talk to Mark. He's so full of ideas. And I turned to him for uh, advice on what to do with the center because he's He's so good at uh, strategic thinking and also pairing up people with uh, strategy. So, Mark, thank you for now sharing our your insights you've gained in South Korea, where he spends a lot of his time with Chemon. Uh, still looking at entrepreneurship and startups, but now in a very exciting uh, world. I don't know whether to call it emerging markets or not. Korea is one of those cases we always struggle with. We don't know where to put it. Uh, but it's certainly one of those countries that has become very dynamic. And uh, so we're looking forward to, Mark, uh, hearing your uh, thoughts on what's happening in South Korea. Great. Thank you, Ravi. Hello, everybody else. Um, I don't think I've met Lenka. There's David. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, George. Hello, George. Nice to meet you. Hi. And Rachel, as, as I go along, feel free to interrupt, okay? Um, if you have a have any questions as we go along. Um, I decided to um, do sort of a fusion sort of presentation for 45 minutes or so on what is going on in terms of my, my area of research is, is – uh, product platforming, technology architectures. And there's a lot of mystique around that. It's actually not complicated at all. I just want to show you what it is and why it's not so very complicated. It makes a lot of sense. And then what uh, it's usually seen as a larger corporate situation. Uh, in Korea, where I spend half my time now, as a master mentor in the National Mentoring Association across the country, uh, I am generally working with entrepreneurs who are not in their 20s, like in Boston, but in their 30s or 40s. They are mature. They're also nearly all really great engineers coming out of the big companies or the chai balls. And um, they're starting their companies with platforming built in. And 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 perhaps that's some of the reason why there's some of them have are achieving explosive growth. They're not waiting until they're fifty million dollars in revenue. They're doing it right away. And when they get money to do prototype development, typically from the government through government programs, they start working on architectures and scalable subsystems and platforms essentially right from the get go. And it's great. Uh, before I get into those ventures that are expressing and doing platforming, and there's many different types, so I'll show you different types. Uh, and I consult or work with them and mentor them. And these are my friends now. And I and I work probably with, last fall, we worked with close to 100 companies uh, in, the, in, in various programs. Uh, and I've just cherry-picked five or six of them to show you examples of what I'm talking about. I thought I should explain a little bit about the Korean entrepreneurship context. So what is platforming? What's the entrepreneurial context? And then um, uh, in Korea, and then we we sort of fuse them together into uh, platforming and startup early stage ventures, which 
you know, I've learned a lot from Korea. I think the rest of the world can learn a lot from the technology and engineering happening inside of Korea in terms of new firms. It's very interesting, very dynamic. So that is my agenda. Uh, I'd like to have uh, Che Wan Lee raise her hand uh, on the... So uh, uh, Che Wan is my spouse. We are married. And, and that's why I have such a great entree into uh, a very different culture. And uh, Che Wan knows everybody in the country. She has been, until just two weeks ago, the provost of a school which is the top ranked national university for STEM disciplines. It's called Seoul National University of Science and Technology. And brilliant engineering and some of the programs I worked on are with Seoul Tech. Uh, and she's a professor of management and really a great uh, partner in a lot of the stuff that, that at least I've been doing. So I just want to acknowledge Che Wan. Along the way, I might ask her to say some comments uh, that will be, you know, better than somebody who's just been there for 10 years. She's been there for, well, she only looks 35, but she's been there for longer than 35 years old, 35. So that is what uh, we're going to do. So, Ravi, hopefully that sounds okay by you. We'll get started. Some other people have showed up. Is that Yang Li? Hello again. It's been a long time. And Sheila. Hi, Sheila. I talked with Dan just yesterday. Yeah. Hey, Mark, Good to see you, everybody. To see you. It's been a long time. I went to yeah. a Korean movie last night at Northeastern. It was called uh, Return to Seoul. I recommend it. Huh. Great. Well, I'll be returning. I'm in Cambridge, Mass. Now I'll be returning to Seoul soon enough. Knock on wood. Love, but love to see that 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 production. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'll be mindful of the clock. I have a few slides that I prepared. So, Catherine, I'm going to share my screen, and off we go. So we'll follow, we'll follow the agenda. By the way, that's myself and Che Won, technology platforming and early stage firms in South Korea. Early stage, yes, but these are not kids starting companies. These are seasoned engineers in their 40s, typically, uh, starting in teams with other engineers. So we'll do platforming principles. We'll do the South Korean venture context. And then we'll look at a small Mark Meyer sample of people who I really like a lot, who are doing platforming in different ways to show you the dynamic nature <clears throat> of engineering and then merging into a business strategy in that country, and then some brief conclusions. So there's me. When I had a mustache and before that I had a beard, the beard came when I was doing a platform consulting project for Gillette, and we were working on India, Ravi, and where the people coming to market were not shaving with cold water, not with warm water, they're shaving with cold water. And, and so the Northeast alum, who was head of all engineering back then, he, he uh, Bob McCall, we designed a single-bladed shaving system with a little plastic comb on it. And we walked in, so we had the answer of a system we can sell for 20 cents, make it for five. And he said, now I want you to go back home and shave uh, for the next week with that product, but don't use any hot water. Use cold water, promise me. So I came in like two weeks later, and we looked like teenagers with a bad case of acne and ingrown hairs and cuts on our faces. And we all grew beards. We became like the Boston Red Sox when they won that world championship, and they all grew those beards. Bob McCall, and I went to buy some razor just yesterday, uh, Ravi, in CVS, and in the top line razor now inside that, that they're selling Gillette, they're like eight bucks a piece, if any of the males here have checked. Uh, the salient feature is that little plastic razor comb that we designed for India that lifts up the hairs to allow you to uh, 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 cut off the, the hairs in a cleaner manner. And that is what we might call innovation from the base of the pyramid ending up in CVS, uh, mm -hmm. right in the United States. That was the sailing innovation. I've worked across a number of companies. Uh, Gillette, 
PNG is now part of PNG, but I worked for all the computer companies in my career on amongst a number of different projects. Most recently, BA Systems and Emerson Electric. Um, and uh, there's been a bunch of stuff. I'm also starting a new medical device company uh, with a brother of mine out of the Mayo Clinic. And my responsibilities at Northeastern are no longer running a group, thank God, or running a center, thank God. Sorry, Robbie. But I'm focused on a joint program with the Mayo Clinic for most of my time to teach healthcare professionals about innovation in improving clinical process flow, data science, and AI. It's really an unbelievable program. Uh, I have a bunch of publications that will make a copy of this later uh, for you, and you can look them up. But I published a lot, and I tend to publish mostly for practitioners, although I have the management sciences and all that. I've won awards from academic management for my academic research. I really enjoy most running for people in business um, who are actually de developing new products and systems and services. So that's me. So let's just talk about platforming pretty quick. Oh, there's some publications. So there's internal platforming, and then there is external platforming. The old guard, of which I'm included, MIT, Black & Decker Power Tools, Caterpillar, the great industrial companies uh, uh, where I grew up working with and doing stuff for, and my own first software company. We were Unix software platforms for real-time process control. The old guard, we always viewed platforms as the engine underneath the hood of a car. So you could really focus on making a heck of a great engine, and then you could pop a passenger car and an SUV on top of it without having to reinvent the wheel for all of them because a powertrain is 30% of the cost. And, you know, if you need to have your engine fixed for any reason, it's also pretty expensive. Get the engine right. The rest sort of works. And, and it's the same thing with the Gillette company. I mean, we I worked on another project for those folks where we, you know, um, Fusion Venus, male women, they all have separate manufacturing lines. It makes no sense for that. When the cartridges should be the same, just with different colors and different add-ons, but the steel, the blades, the, the 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 lion's part of the of the product should be a platform. So that's how I was schooled, how I was taught by some wonderful people in manufacturing companies, did it myself, my own software companies. And it's very powerful, and I still am working on this stuff all the time in industry. I have a number of projects that are more important than ever where companies still are not able to share technology across product lines, which is too bad. It's getting even more so in healthcare with the Mayo Clinic in the development of AI to healthcare and large language models. You need to share data. You, you need to look at data as a platform and share it across clinical applications around the world. Anyhow. So there's some publications on the left. There's other people who have published a lot in internal platforming, but not as much as me. That's right on the left. And I look at that. We have had some great people at Northeastern. Mike Zach retired um, and now plays saxophone in the Cantam Lodge in Central Square, but River members. And we, we wrote an article that's really still very powerful on the design and development of information products. It's still used a lot. And then we had a bunch of people, Alex and so forth. Uh, we looked at the implementation of platforming in a global enterprise. That's a data-rich case study uh, of Philips LED. And then what happened is the strategy people came in, a number of them at our own university, but also at BU. And they said, you know, platforming is too complicated. If you don't have an engineering degree, let's make it a business strategy. And let's look at Airbnb and think about becoming the hub of an ecosystem of companies uh, that then sell through you so you make a lot of money. Or you don't actually own the resources. They do, like Airbnb. But we monetize that by providing a new business model and access to those resources. It's a great idea. I actually wrote about that. Years ago, with an HP software person named Rob Seliger, product platforming for software involvement. If you look at the great software companies in Boston, like the MathWorks, it's all they do. They have 20,000 applications. They only make 100 of them. All the rest are third parties selling through, building on MathWorks libraries and selling through MathWorks to the world. Uh, the Parker and Von Alstein became the leaders 
uh, in terms of citations and popularity in terms of building a theory around Airbnb. It's a very powerful theory. And if you can combine A and B together, maybe that's the best of all worlds. And I'll have an example of a few in Korea that are doing that. So internal platforms, external focused platforms. Is that is that clear for everybody? That's a that's a really quick summary of, of, of what these when you hear the word platform, it can mean a million different things. I encourage you to think about what's underneath the hood and then an Airbnb model, a business model as a platform. So sorry, Mark, when you say an external platform, you mean customers actually connect a use the platform versus internal platforming is when you know caterpillar uses a platform as a yeah. customer i don't necessarily see deal with the platform directly airbnb is, is has created an external marketplace for people who own homes who want to rent out rooms and academics people call that a platform that is a marketplace the word is used interchangeably and loosely. A platform in a marketplace. <clears throat> Since it's not underneath the hood of a car, for me, it's an external platform facing outward. An internal platform <clears throat> is really facing inward, a common resource shared across product lines that then customers benefit from. Okay. Uh, sorry, can I interject there? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I, I've just published an article actually in Harvard Business Review about how Chinese companies use uh, internal information platforms. So that's a third type of platform. So there's the technology platforms, mm -hmm. and I've worked on that myself actually, ironically, with um, Wilkinson Sword Racers. Um, so you, you've got product technology physical platforms, you've got external market platforms, and then you've got internal information platforms and Chinese companies now manage themselves that way as well. But I think you, your talk is about physical technology platforms. No, no, it, and that's a that's a great comment. But uh, if you see the uh, these t the first bullet point on that list is is physical platforms. Second bullet point is all about software platform uh, services platforms based okay. on data in IT. All right. Third bullet point is all about information refineries and internal information products. Let me let me give you a, and it's just not the Chinese. I mean, the best example, in my opinion, uh, is the Mayo Clinic. It's a 17 going on $18 billion number one healthcare enterprise in the world now. And they only have three physical facilities. Well, they're adding more, <clears throat> but they're different parts of the States. But what they've done is they've seen so many patients. They've got aggregated so much data. Uh, uh, hundreds and millions of records from around. And so what they've done is they've aligned, de-identified the data, then clustered them. And now they're doing hundreds of partnerships around the world, including China, including Korea, other places, for clinicians to make large medical models using those data. And so they're combining a whole ecosystem of clinical informatics people to develop clinical diagnostic systems around their data. And, and they're monetizing it. They're monetizing it. <clears throat> uh, we And, and uh, it's a very exciting, it's very really exciting to watch. As a matter of fact, the, the Biden administration uh, recently announced a new healthcare AI policy uh, to ensure that the large medical models aren't just for white guys like me, but for a diverse population in different countries, from different countries, and are fair and equitable uh, to all. And the person leading that whole initi uh, initiative is my co-director of a Mayo program. He's an MD. He's a CIO. And and we're approaching it. He, he is approaching it from uh, a test suite a diverse data set model um, that is, uh, well, I think it's spot on. So you are correct. Data can be a very, you know, data is the new is the new gold uh, out there in modern society. And we're just figuring out what to do with it. Let me just move on a little bit because I, I, I'm on slide four. That's how it's a wonderful audience. You never get past your first slide, Ravi. But let me just, let me just do a few more. 
So what do platforms mean? I think we'll turn to this. So here's here's a platform for a P&G project. There's a little diaper. And then what the classic thinking is, you identify your different customer groups, newborns, toddlers, and seniors, the grays. And basically, they all have needs of absorption, odor, poop and pee containment, and low cost. Sorry for the gross example. It's one of the biggest platform examples in the world. Still is. Save their business. And then... Within that, there's latent needs in each customer group Then you then try and serve with value-added engineering. Uh, for the newborns, it's to teach dads when to change their kids' diapers because they don't know really when to do it at first. Uh, in the toddler, it's really about having chemistry in the diaper that it turns really cold after the little kid pees a little bit so that they take off the diaper themselves and go to the toilet, and that relieves the need of the mom or dad in terms of potty training a young kid. And then for the elderly, uh, it is all about disguise. It's so like you don't want anybody to know that you are actually wearing diapers. And so uh, the way it all works out in a large manufacturing company is you'll do a product architecture and then you'll focus on the thing in the middle, the common core, and just make lots and lots of that common material and stack in different sizes in ranges to fit all three customer groups, user applications, and you add stuff around it to actually tune it to that target user. So that's classic platforming. Here's another one that 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 uh, I have, in, have enjoyed working on. It's kind of weird that you take the same concept and go from a little you go from a little kid into a, a an electronic warfare system to both detect threats and then to respond with precision strike. So you have incoming, you have outgoing, and they have common command and control software. And in a company such as this, it's the market leader, every single airplane, every simple single weapon system, every single thing that they make has had a different stack of software. And then <clears throat> new uh, things come in such as asynchronous warfare, such as drones that then can communicate data that's needed for firing a missile for guidance or detect a drone that's a threat on a ship. And pretty soon it becomes awfully complicated to keep up with everything unless you have a platform approach within a common systems architecture. So it's very different technology and it is software and electronics. And it isn't paper materials in a diaper, but in principle, they're the same idea. So then when you get into platforming, you basically have layers of technology in an architecture where the common motors, the common materials, the common radio software, whatever it is, they're called fixed points across an architecture. And what you do is you make them the same way, but you scale them out so they can hit different applications and then the customizations on top of them are called the flex points. And then what you do is you then package them up to different applications. It's a basic framework that we use when we go into a big company, typically. Here's one last example, then we'll get on to Korea. So this is a $10 billion company. It's called Philips. Any Philips people? Uh I spent three or four years working on this stuff. So they're going from basically uh, fluorescent light bulbs, Ravi, into LED. And LED makes sense because it's a tenth of the electricity of an old light bulb. Save a lot of money. And then a bunch of computer folks come along. And they say, well, an LED is actually uh, a diode on a printed circuit board. And by God, you can have different things on a printed circuit board. Then you say, well, what can I do? If I make a light a sensor, well, that's a really powerful idea. So this is was Philips. It's now called Signify because McKinsey told them they should break up the best R&D center in the world because they could make more money. I don't understand that. But now this is the professional lighting division called Signify, about $10 billion. And they have three major market segments in professional lighting. The first is office on the top left. The second on the right is outdoor lighting in a city. 
And the one on the bottom left is inside a retail store. And in each one of these segments, there are different use cases that a sensor and a light connected with an underlying platform of communications and data science, a big cloud database, you can start issuing alerts in response to different situations, kind of like the missile system idea. So on the left, have you ever tried to book a conference room and you have trouble doing it because somebody's in there or you're trying to find one that's open? Well, the LED light now in modern office buildings is a sensor hooked up to conference room booking software. On the right for any major city now that is modernizing, you know, it's just not lighting up the thing and seeing if the light is on or off. It's really about traffic control, pollution. In certain cities in the United States, these LED lights are now becoming primary sensors for gunshots. Like is somebody shooting at somebody? Horrible. But that's becoming a primary use case. In a store, all the LEDs now can be CCTV cameras. And you can tell if somebody's lifting an expensive luxury brand purse off a shelf. So there's all these things now that you're doing. And to do that, you need a layer of technology. We can skip this, but this is how it works in the electronics business in terms of the stack of hardware, software, communications, and services, and then companies organize around that. I have a paper that we recently wrote on this uh, that is pretty granular, pretty granular. So then this comes up with the, the basic theory of how platforming works into a business. Uh, you basically have your users and use cases up on the top. You then have your platforms of different types, service, software. I can add information to me. Data is like software. Hardware platforms and manufacturing platforms. And that's all focused on reducing the cost of, goal, uh, goods, uh, cost of goods sold and getting new products out more rapidly. And then underneath the whole thing are next generation technologies. Uh, either in software or data science or in materials to actually allow you to keep the whole engine going. That's the basic mindset that we use. And that's my own reference point for then looking at the Korean ventures that we'll see in a second. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little pause. That's that's like platforming 101, but quite honestly, companies large and small are struggling. Not so much with the basic idea, but how to reorganize and implement around it, particularly in a global enterprise. And my career has been helping them do it. Okay. We'll kind of skip this, but in software, for who mentioned about data science there in software, in software, the connections between subsystems are more important, actually, than the subsystems themselves. Those are the red lines and the key subsystems are in the black. We'll see that in the Korean venture. Now, let's get to the, the, the main topic, which is then how does this framework apply to early stage firms, the sample South Korean ventures? Now to do that, we need to know a little bit about South Korea. So we have a few slides here and Che Wong, you're, you're wanting to pop in, you know, we Korea was nowhere in the news five years ago, right? For most of us. And then, all of a sudden, everybody fell in love with K-drama. It's sort of like the, the rise of, of K-drama came up with the rise of Netflix. And, and, and then Chaewon put this slide together. So K-pop over on the bottom right, the most popular bands now in the world. It's unbelievable. Where are they coming from? Well, a lot of them are coming from Korea. And... And it really is fandom over there. It's it's rather amazing. How many people here actually watch K-drama on Netflix? Anybody? Is anybody a, a, a K-drama fan? A secret K-drama fan? Ravi? Any? I I, I, I think I did all. watch <clears throat> I did watch Squid Game. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> Shay Wong used to play that as a little kid, by the way. She told me. That was a that was an old game, right, Chaewon? Oh, yeah. wow. And then, you know, we talk about food. If you ever get a chance to put it on your bucket list, 
there's there's kimchi, but that's 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 just the little little piece of things. Uh, the Korean cuisine is rather it's really a core part of their culture, so it's very popular. I'm going to show you some, you know, how this really started off. Uh, it started off as a very, very poor country. The country was formed in the early 50s. It started off dirt poor. Uh, you can see that's the bottom of the list. The very bottom of the list. Here's some other emerging markets. Rob, you've probably seen these data in your other seminars. But this is fat. This is where it started. Uh, uh, some of our friends grew up on the border of North Korea as farmers that did not have running water and no electricity. And that's how they grew up. Now they're professors in universities. That's unbelievable. But that's where it started uh, in, in when the country was formed. Uh, and now it's it's really accelerated. A few months ago, we were in the Philippines. Boy, it's just really different between Korea and the Philippines now. It's just jumped and leapfrogged right over. It's one of the fastest growing countries in Asia. Here's some recent data. Up to 2022, there you go. Philippines is at the bottom of the list. I was actually stunned at how undeveloped or lesser developed the Phil we were in Manila uh, versus going back to Korea. So you can see those data. Again, we'll send these out to you. And, and a lot of things have gone into this. We'll talk about that real quick. It's now the world's 12th largest economy. Uh, and it's typically been the land of the giants or being an old tech guy, the land of the bigs. So these are, most of these are Chabal, which are family firms that are conglomerates. Samsung, now four times bigger than IBM. Hyundai, Kia. Uh, I, the Genesis for Hyundai is rated better than Mercedes-Benz in the United States now for luxury sedan. Uh, the Kia Sorento is the best rated large SUV in the United States right now for this year. I, I, and Kias used to be cheap cars. Hyundais were really third also rents behind the Japanese companies. It's, it's a remarkable transition. Posco is the company nobody knows about, but it's a huge steel company. I think Che Wan, they just made an offer to buy U.S. Steel. <clears throat> and, and POSCO was really important because about 10 years ago, the Korean government said that these large Che Ball could also set up venture funds. So corporate strategic investment in Korea is a big deal. POSCO is probably the biggest it's a steel company. It's investing all sorts of AI material stuff. It, it is a powerhouse. In, in venture investment in Korea. Hanwha is like the defense company I just showed you. It is it is uh, electronic warfare. It's made, it actually, Korea just made its own fighter jet and selling around the world now. So Hanwha is now selling its own version of an F-35, the F-16 fighter jet. And where we live in Korea, we know that because we live about five miles away from the, the military airport. And when they had their you know, they had their defense show about four months ago. It was all over us. It was, you know, they're flying all around in formation. It was, we thought we were at war a few times, you know, it was unbelievable. So all this stuff is happening. Celtrion is a really interesting company. They make money, monoclonal antibodies, and they apply them to different rare diseases. They're the biggest of the life sciences companies in Korea. Uh, they're catching up on that. SK Bio is uh, is a spin out of the telephone company, uh, South Korean Telco, but they set up a bio division and they're pretty big in vaccines, but they're not really the hot life sciences company. There's new ventures that are, but Celtrion is very significant. Now, what we see, uh, we, we, I'll show you a picture here. Let me just skip down this picture. If, this is the original tech innovation cluster called, it's Kangnam in Korea. I'm sure many of you have been to Korea. And there's a section called Tehran Street. It's a street. And I guess they had some relationship with the old Shah of Iran. It's actually called Tehran Street. And that was the first government-funded 
innovation cluster where all the tech companies who got government funding, they were, they were, they got basically cheap or free office space in Tehran Street. It has since become known as Silicon Alley, not Valley, but Silicon Alley, because there are more cosmetic surgeons there per square mile than probably any place in the world. So facial surgery tourism is a big thing in Creadale along that same street called Tehran Street. It's kind of funny. And then over on the right is a second technology cluster in a sister city called Sungnam. That is where Che Wan and I have a second home in Korea. And we walked through Kendall Square. I have two degrees from MIT. I started two companies in Kendall Square back in my 20s and 30s. I'm part of MIT. I'm part of Kendall Square culture for one side of my life. It's really impressive, but not for its startups. Now in Kendall Square, it's all about Google owns Kendall Square and MIT and huge life sciences companies building huge co buildings there, all the big pharmas. In Pangyo, it's startups. I mean, there are some unicorns there, most of them in gaming software, but it's a land of startups. It's uh, thousands of them. And that's a picture of that. And then Che Wan and I fortunately live on the other side over those hills there in a beautiful little villagey sort of place with a thousand wonderful restaurants or about a, about 10, but we have a little beautiful place and, and, uh, but that's where we work. And the, 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 the companies that I see, I just go back real quick to that slide, a lot of AI and healthcare and drug discovery, data science, a lot. We see a lot of environmental software companies, data science around environment. I see quite a few robotics companies. Hyundai bought all the Boston robotics companies. I'm sure you've seen that, Boston Robotics. I think they made a pitch for iRobot. I think they own iRobot now. So Hyundai is nuts about robotics everywhere. Um, we see a lot of media. The old high-tech industry in Pongyo wasn't enterprise software, it was computer games. Really dynamic, I hate to call them killing games, but most of them are fantasy killing games, most of them. And you have big companies, billion dollar companies that are leaders in that sort of media. And from that, we have VR or different sort of XR applications for things that are not gaming. Uh, we see ventures that are all about cosmetics personalized to individual people and not just women. Like, you know, I'm looking at all my colleagues here, myself also, we're sort of like thinning out a little bit, right? So somebody now has an app, uh, several ventures to come up with our cell phone, take a picture of our head and identify what types of hair loss, the degree of hair loss. Uh, some of them do chemical swabbing and then they have personalized things to put in. I haven't used them, Robbie, I should. Uh, to impede continued hair loss. But for women, it's all sort of cosmetic. Che Wan is the expert in this, but it it is a land of cosmetics and personal beauty. So there's, there's a lot of that going on. And then, as I noted, life sciences is taking flight. One of my friends run, over there runs a company that does early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And they're in 100 hospitals, and he's he's a publicly traded company now, and, and that's all Korean original. So that is the that is sort of what's going on in Korea. I just want to be a little bit mindful of time here. I'm going to move on to the next part, R&D intensity. Che Wan, the numbers don't lie, do they? This is R&D intensity as measured by R&D spend versus GDP. So it's a percentage. And we can see China, how aggressive it is. Korea, Taiwan, Japan is disturbing, disturbingly low. Um, that's a shocking set of data to me. And for those of you that, you know, uh, 
no Asia well, it's it makes no sense saying that it's just Asia. Every country's different, particularly Japan, Korea, and China. They're so very completely different cultures, completely different ecosystems, completely different. You know, we have more in common with Mexico than Korea does with Japan. A lot more in common. It's a very different place. So the cultural characteristics, I've never seen people work harder. When the government says do something, everybody just does it. It's not a sales job. You, you try and do that in the United States, don't work. In Korea, there's a tremendous respect. And the people who work in government, they all went to Seoul National University and got the highest test scores. It's seen as a, a career path that is better actually than working in a company, unless you're one of the tribal scions and you're, you know, you're you're worth billions of dollars before you even get your job. So government service is respected. A lot of the rulemaking is based on carefully studying what's going on around the world and setting policy. And then there's a traditional value system. Uh, do you, Che Wan, do you want to make any comments briefly about the traditional value system? Or should I just keep on running forward here? Yeah, you you can keep on going and then I will get this some um like a questions later so we can keep the time. Okay, good. Well, let me let me just say that education is 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 I never seen education push so hard as in Korea. Uh I I've never seen so much respect for elders as in Korea. I'm sure there is in other societies, but like the fact that I'm an American professor. Ravi, they call it a kyosinine. People bow. Well, they generally bow to each other, but it's very different than at Northeastern University. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and there is discipline and respect throughout the culture. And, and some people, Samsung sounds like the great consumer products company that we all use their products. But if you go work there, it's like joining the military and you follow your orders. You never complain. You work there until they ask you to leave at the age of 55, whatever. It is regimented. It's not what you think. It's a very, very regimented society within a company. So let me let me now go on to, well, this is really, Che Wan and I have talked a lot about this. There are some, my entrepreneurs come out of this. And in some ways, some of them, they benefited from it, but they don't like some, they're rebelling a little bit against the culture. Uh, unrelenting competition and young kids are squeezed to perfection. They have the highest suicide rate of OECD countries. The highest teenage suicide rate of all developed countries is in is South Korea. That's rather shocking. They never get a break. You know, they go to school all day. They go to private schools at night to learn English or whatever. And then on the weekend, off they go again. I, I don't think they even have five hours of just downtime if you're under 18 years old in Korea. Uh, ranked 102nd on the satisfaction of life. I, so that's not me, Ravi. I love Korea, I, but I'm not a product of Korea. I'm a new entrance, enjoying all that what comes out of this. But people feel pressure, very low, and, and part of that now is that it's led to a very low birth rate. So they have a real serious problem in terms of their population decline. And when they forecast out for, you know, for 20 years, they've got to open up the borders to immigration, or else Samsung and so forth won't have people to do the work. And Korean is a heck of a hard language to learn. There's a lot of challenges to, to, to solve that problem. And then I meet many people, they come to see me and they want to open up their companies in America because they want to raise their families in America. They don't want their kids to go through what they went through. Those are not everybody, but some of my friends who come in as entrepreneurs and say, let's scale up our business globally. There's there's stuff going on. Che Wan, do you want to make a comment to that before I move on to the ventures? Yeah, like uh, this is uh, like uh, biggest problem of Korea, um, uh, because we really uh driving ourselves to fast growing. So 
this is a kind of a side effect and, and everybody is getting tired uh, to compete with each other. And also like uh, the work ethic is like a working hard and things like that. So it has uh, changed a little bit now. So we call like a, a Gen, Gen Z and they don't want to work uh, like their parents. And so uh, it has uh, changed a lot. And also the, it is a common language that uh, like life work uh, balance. And so uh, I think that I uh, see lots of hopes. Um, and also another thing is that and that our parents like me just uh, really focusing on their happiness, uh, children's happiness, and uh, encourage them to do entrepreneurship. So good thing about entrepreneurship now in Korea, and the uh, the high school and middle school entrepreneurship course is a mandatory course. So it, it is a big change because everybody talking about like a suicide rate and what is the happiness for our children's. And so uh, this entrepreneurship education shows what we are going to do uh, in the future. Yeah. But the problems are, the problems are real. They are real and they haven't really been solved yet, but there's hopeful progress. So what time do we have, Ravi? I left my watch in the other room. Uh, we're scheduled till one fifteen, I think. Catherine, and, correct? What yeah. And what time is it right now, Robbie? Uh, uh, Twelve forty-eight. Good. So let me now just go on to the now. Let me bring these two pieces together uh, and look at platforming as it expresses itself in early stage firms. Let me just skip a little bit. Oh well, since Che Wan is here, you should know the other key thing is that the Korean government with all these smart policymakers are really going after it. And, and, and the way they've been decided to go after it for 10 years now has been a program called TIPS, which stands for Technology Innovation Program Support, whatever it stands for. And if you put together a nice PowerPoint and you've worked before, a little bit, you can get $500,000 in grants to build your prototype. There are, the seed investors don't really exist that much in Korea because they put all their money into real estate. The government recognized this, so they created their own seed fund. It's called TIPS out of one of the ministries. There's two ministries. Uh, ministry for Small, Medium-Sized Enterprises and Startups. They allocate $14 billion a year for ventures. Uh, if you just want to look to the right there at the bottom of that screen, our SMBA has 5.5 billion. So three times Korea is three times as much to support small business. And its economy is its annual budget is, is a fraction of ours. If you look at the Ministry of ICT, who I work for both of these, Ravi, I work for both of these ministries upon occasion, running programs for them. ICT is where a lot of the AI is going on, a lot of the data science, a lot of stuff is happening. They have $18 billion focused on core technology development and startups using it. The national mentoring program of which I'm a part is sponsored by ICT primarily. Now, I do a lot of work with the National Science Foundation. Their equivalent budget for the same thing is $10 billion, and it's increased under President Biden who's doing the right thing. So, and, and if you asked, if you asked the models that they're following in Korea, they, you know, they, for years, they've looked at the Israeli prototyping fund as something that they should do. And in typical Korean fashion, they work harder and put like twice as much money into it. It's very, very important. And then with the money comes mentoring, with the money comes subsidized office space. And if you really do your prototyping well, then there's other grants to do global marketing. They send hundreds of companies, it feels like, to computer electronics show every year. They just finished that up. They will give you money to do your patents. So early stage ventures are much more advanced in patenting than early stage ventures at Northeastern. No comparison. And then we have seen work in corporate spinoffs. The, what's going on is when you get in your mid-50s, uh, the, the big companies ask you to kind of leave and they'll actually give you money to leave. 
to start a company, to spin out technology that they'll never use themselves, but by owning stock in your company and having support in it, uh, you might help monetize that IP. There's a lot of stuff going on here uh, in terms of the government. That's probably the biggest difference between the US and Korea. Well, the entrepreneurs tend to be older and the government is much, much more active in supporting the entrepreneurs. I see great technology in Boston. I see just as great technology in Korea. I actually get more excited by the the technology in Korea now than technology in Boston. It might be because I know that the lunch, Catherine, that's waiting for me after having my mentoring session, I know it's going to be pretty awesome. But the technology is very, very special. Ravi, if, if you get your shoulder operated on in Korea, in the United States, you know, you'll, 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 you go your rehab and they'll tell you do your exercises and, they, and you won't know the difference. You know, you try to do it. You know, if you're doing it correct, you go in when it doesn't work well and you have your appointments once a week. In Korea, you will now use uh, XR technology to actually monitor your daily exercise, if it's accurate or not. It's just starting to come to the United States, by the way. The, the CMS has just issued a code to reimburse uh, physical therapists for remote consults through different VR headsets so they can see their patients exercise. But that's the type of stuff that, that we're seeing in, in Korea. So now, VC funding, we talked about government support. The VC industry in Korea is nothing compared to the United States. It's really weak. The government is trying to fix it, but the big deal is that the large chaballs are putting a lot of money uh, into the Korean ventures. Now, onto the onto the the fusion. Okay, this touch points, our touch points, and I say I mean Chewan and myself. Uh, I. And the national mentoring program, which is countrywide, I work with about 50 companies per year through a series of direct one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, either on Zoom or face-to-face -face when I'm in the country. We worked on another program where they had over 100 metaverse gaming, education, and other companies just focused on metaverse. You talk about Facebook and meta and all that. Very, very, very powerful in Korea, but really not for the big metas. This is really for startups. Uh, it comes out of K-drama. A lot of the graphic artists and production people of the movie business have now come into software for glasses, different sets. And uh, a lot of it is not virtual reality. A lot of it is enhanced reality, XR versus VR. Because still most people get dizzy when they throw those things on for more than 10 minutes. I like to call it XR. So we worked with over 100 ventures there. And then... Um, Che Wan's own university got a big grant from the Small Business Administration over there to work with ventures. Uh, this past fall, 60 ventures. Uh, we worked with 18 of them very, very directly in a boot camp and direct one-on-one -on -one consultant. The focus of it is how to take what they got and scale it to the uh, to 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 America. So you throw this all together. Last year, I would say that we've touched over 100 ventures ourselves personally. And I'm just going to cherry pick a few ventures out of the sample. I want you to know it's not by reading an article. It's all been by direct interaction and really getting to know people and their motivations and passions and and becoming becoming uh, becoming trusted partners with them. So here's here's platforming classic. So you see those two gentlemen over on the right on your screen. Can you see that on the right? Those are two chemical engineers who went to a Third tier university, second tier university. I got to work with one of them. They didn't really know how to dress that well. A real chemical engineer. And now they have a country that's probably doing $130 million a year in revenue. It's probably hell. And what they do is they do fingernail extensions for women that has a heat lamp in the middle. Then the chemical engineer designed a nail glue 
that's layered on a substrate upon which they put an incredible variety of patterns on top in different sizes and shapes, some with gems, some without gems. Uh, and uh, and then you put you just put it on your finger. I know I've done it myself. All the all the all the women in the office are shocked that an American professor is putting on nails for them, but it was a lot of fun to do. You put it on the heat lamp, it warms up the glue and it's on. And you can't really get it off unless you try really hard. It lasts for a while. And then their market line extension was to go in platform thinking from fingernails and over on the right are toes, toenails. That's classic, common platform, two different market applications. $80 million in Korea, all the rest coming from abroad. Can't buy it in a store. As far as I know, it's all an online business, which means it's really high margin. And that's why those two gentlemen on the right are smiling, but they're chemical engineers. I don't know their personal history, but one of them I talked to, I said, how do you come up with this idea? And he said, well, we, I couldn't get a date in college. I don't know. I Chemical engineer and, and, and sort of, I don't know, we just had to do this stuff. We had a bunch of ladies helping us with the testing and things like that. And one thing took its real entrepreneurship. And that's a probably held company with $4 million in venture capital investment. So those investors are pretty darn happy. We would love to see something like that in the United States. So that's one example. I call that platforming classic. Next example. By the way, I took our little map or little framework, <clears throat> which is <clears throat> hardware platform, process platform. Hardware platform is the heat gun and the, 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 the heater and the, the glue on the substrate. <clears throat> and the process platform is the chemistry production process for making the glue. Then the products are above the light green shade. <clears throat> Basically, use cases are from, this is so simple. It's from hands to toes. And then for them, the new users are basically going to America. The name of the company for you ladies in the audience is called Gluga, like glue. And the brand is called Ohora. <clears throat> Tremendous company. Fun company. <clears throat> Number two. <clears throat> this is an example of AI platforming. And it's now going across different applications. This is my mentee. She's young. She's out of the Women's University, EY Women's University. She's an engineer. She has a team of five or six people, got initial funding from the government to develop a prototype. The problem that she solved is that in Korea, unfortunately, gross guys were installing cameras in women's toilets in places like Northeast and universities or public restrooms and just doing silly stuff with the videos. And so she was at the women's university. She's an engineer. She gets a government grant to solve the problem. And she made a product called Savvy, which is a little battery powered device. That's it's, 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 it's no bigger than this mouse that glues onto the wall, has an infrared camera, which means it works at night, infrared at night, very clever engineer. And then goes up to the cloud, a lot of AI stuff going on on motion. And so her team can tell if somebody's installing a camera or not, or doing something else. They Or somebody has fallen in a toilet or is being abused in a stall. So that has been her use case. And these are large language models in real time that are detecting threats inside a public restroom. So that's what she's been doing. It's, you know, she's she's installed at a dozen universities and on what's next. And so the example of my mentoring is, what's next? So we've landed on assisted living gray towns. Think about if you have an elderly parent living in an assisted living center like I do. You don't, you know, now with a I watch, you can tell maybe if they've fallen, but not really, really. A lot of false alerts. There's nothing that can tell if a stove has been shut off, which is a huge threat, especially a gas stove. For burns and fire, but this thing is infrared. And what can infrared do? Heat signatures. So having one of these over every stove in an elderly person's home, connected to the cloud, great idea. 
so she is she's she's doing that sort of thing and and, and so that's an example of using AI and software. This is a hardware and software platform in the cloud to go from restroom safety to safety in the home for the elderly population. Classic, 12 patents, all paid for by the government. Great young woman, great engineer, great listener, very respectful. Hard working, look at that. Learning model accuracy for their target applications in the restroom, 99.86%. That's how that's how queen engineers think, male or female. Like, don't get to 90%, get to 100%. And they'll work day and night to make it happen. Third example. This is, uh, that is a more youthful picture of my friend Jay June, but he's maybe in his mid-50s. Came out of Samsung, 20 years of Samsung. Uh Little guy, so he decided to focus on if his own kids would be too little if they need hormone shots, quite literally. Personal driver. So he designed an AI engine that takes radiology scans from an X-ray, and based on a large language model developed with dozens of hospitals now used in 100, is your child at a certain age of a certain gender going to need shots or not? Predictive bone growth for youth, amazing. And it's highly accurate. It's used across all the hospitals in Korea now. He's raised three or $4 million in venture capital. And now we've been talking about how to extend it into other applications. He's released a micro fracture detection for emergency rooms, different part of the hospital. He's now released something for osteoarthritis for old people to tell if somebody needs cortisone shots or not, what's disease progression for bone disease. It's all about bones. It's all based on metrics. It's all based on making data out of images and then helping different types of physicians. But now, this company is only four or five years old. This is an amazing amount of platforming. For, you would never see this in the United States. Wouldn't, wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen. They they would focus on the first application for 10 years and hope to get bought by GE. Honest, because I've seen it. The Korean entrepreneurs thinking with an engineering background, well, let's get one. And then next year, let's move on to another. Let's do another one. And let's come up with a sweeter portfolio based on common technology. And then they'll work really hard to make it happen and hire other great engineers to make it happen couple more examples. What's this? Oh, this one is really interesting. This is a company called Hana Loop. This is my friend, Korean guy, and his boss is his wife. She's the CEO. He's the CTO. Chen Wan, I won't make any comments that I, I'm in the same situation. I'm only kidding you. But the, 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 she, she is the sales and marketing person. He's the engineer. And so basically what happened is that the world is going green, not all the world, but some of it. And in Europe, I don't know if anybody has a lot of European experience. Europe, they've gone really into this. They have regulations now that if you're importing electronics into Europe, you have to certify, you have to account for all the carbon that's gone in making that subassembly. <clears throat> so if you're a Korean subassembly manufacturer for like a modem, whatever it is, uh, uh, an electrical controller, you, before you can ship it into the, any EU country, in the EU economy, what is it, Ravi? Is it now bigger than the United States who put them all together? It's a major market for all companies doing export. You cannot do that as of two months ago unless you had an accounting statement for accounting footprint. You cannot, you cannot import to Europe. Maybe some people cheat, but that's the law. And so this was a big opportunity for the Korean, uh, for Korea, because all they, you know, they're really into electronics and so exporting electronics to different partners around the world, Europe being one of them. And so this team uh, developed enterprise software that automatically ties into utility companies in your local area in Korea, sucks in all the data that you use for different types of you know using computers doing manufacturing doing testing breaks it all out and then 
sucks in data from your ERP system to fill the rest of the, in a sense, a PNL that is your carbon accounting footprint that is then put into the format required by EU countries for import, produces the whole report. And this replaces literally a half a dozen employees with one person just overseeing the software. A lot of it happens automatically and it's very efficient. That's that's a that's a software sustainability play. The reason why I put this up as an important part of platforming <clears throat> is the interfaces between a system and stuff from the outside. In this case, the linkages to the major utility companies, the major transportation companies, all that stuff in order to have models then applied to say what's the cost per unit for something that's being exported. It's a great company. Uh, it, it, he would be a great guest speaker, by the way. He went to Carnegie Mellon uh, here to get his PhD. These A lot of these Korean entrepreneurs are a little bit older. They have PhDs from the United States, from great universities. Very smart people, very humble, very nice, great listeners, and very, very dedicated. Last company, a little bit different. So we've done... We've gone from so, uh, uh, cosmetics. That's why I love Korea, Ravi. And one, you know, in a course of a month, I see cosmetics companies, I see IoT AI companies, I see medical companies, I see sustainability companies. They're teaching me more than I'm teaching them. So here's the last one. Uh, this is a company called Step In. It's just launching its products. You see the individual on the right? He's the CEO. He might look like he's in his 20s, but he's in his 40s. Same story. Comes out of a big company, Chaewon. I don't know what company he was working at before. I forgot to ask him, but it, do you remember? Was it Hyun? One of the big Chaebol. So anyhow, he he had this vision of 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 developing a media company using the web. K-pop is really popular amongst people, increasing around the world. So he basically developed an app that teaches people how to K-pop dance. And to do this, he brought in a team of a half a dozen young Korean guys serving in the Korean military in their cyber warfare unit. Very much like the Israelis. They have a special units for cyber warfare stuff. And he said, how do you like to stay working together after you leave the military service after a couple of years? They all said, yes, I'd like to work on Vision ID for K-pop dancing. And they just, they loved it. And so they are his hit team. And what they do <clears throat> is they help people learn how to do the, and so they'll introduce a new k-pop dance every week or two it's number one number two it tells you how in practice mode to do it slow and then you speed it up and it gives you a percentage accuracy in terms of how well you're doing to the dance and he hires professional k-pop dancers men and women to be the models then number three what what the scene is, then you can compete against your friends. That's called, I learned this, it's called a K-pop battle, not competition. And then it scores and tells you who won the battle. <clears throat> and what what's 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 really happening is is let me see if this works. And to do this, I I think what I have to do. Can you hear that sound at all or no? No. I can't hear you, Robbie. Go ahead. Let me stop sharing. No, we can hear. We can we can uh, certainly see the video, and I thought I heard the audio. Let me just do this real quick. Share advanced computer audio. Share. Now it will work. Yeah, the video. Oops. 
can you can you see the video or not? No, we can't see the video. I can't see uh, the video. I can hear the audio. Let me give it one more shot, and then I'll just share the link with you. Uh, basic screen. Let me try this again. Yeah. One more shot. Yeah. One more now shot. it should work. It's really work. It's really. It's more than a gimmick because I'll tell you what they're doing to that was their ces that was their ces uh presentation uh so what's going on there in terms of platform number one in the core engine they're using what they use for identity management for security applications where you see the circles on the body so they can tell if you're how tall you are, who you are, and things like that, and then they can measure motion. So in in Korea now, if you bring out a gun in inside the city of Busan, like all the mass killing in the United States now, and you're what you pull out a gun, there's likely to be a camera with a software behind it that says this person is a threat and an issues response alert to the police. That's the same identification being used, are you following the right K-pop motion? Then the second thing, which is kind of new, he told me about it, but I, I, he just did it for CS, is if somebody uh, doesn't want to be seen for identity management or they're not in shape, whatever it is, do you see the av the perfect avatar that he, they overlaid on top of the... I, I, to me, that's stunning. So that's And then the third part, you saw the scaled up dance competition. So now they're thinking like dancing with the stars online and having judges and sponsors. And what's really becoming, it's becoming a business model. It's be, not only an internal platform, but it's now stepping into an external platform where all sorts of people, they hope an ecosystem of people contributing new dances, new games, will be working through their cloud platform to host events and you know build community. It, it's, it's a very different sort of special platforming example the the thing that we're then talking about in terms of platforms i mean he's so busy now that he's not going to get to this for a while but every yoga studio would want this itself for its virtual work every physical therapy uh practice would want this for its virtual instruction it's it's this could be a very very exciting xr it's not headset xr platform that people can use uh, for a variety of applications. So my my final my final takeaways are Korea is already very powerful in tech entrepreneur, but it's not a little you know the little engine that could. It's already a big engine, and I just see it starting to accelerate. It's very very powerful. Uh, in my experience, relative to the United States, <clears throat> Korean founders have an attuned sense of platform because they're all skilled, mature engineers already. So they get it. They've been doing it. We just fine tune things. And then the last thing that is rather special is that the government plays a very, very powerful role, just not in supporting entrepreneurs, but in supporting initiatives in different new areas, whether it's green or AI. And I, I suspect, you know, every with every new government, every five years in Korea, there'll be a new bunch of people working in the Ministry of ICT or Ministry of Small Business. And they say, now we got to get good at this. Let's have special money going into a specific area. And it's at a size and scale that even makes our own National Science Foundation look not worse, not better, but kind of an equal. It's a very impressive operation that they have going on in Korea. So those are my those are my those are my major takeaways. I if I was to write a paper on this, Ravi, I would just write a paper saying. Platforming doesn't have to be for big companies. It can start right from the word go. Let's look at Korea. Mm -hmm. And there'll be plenty of evidence to support that proposition.
proposition. Terrific. We're all, almost on the dot. I mean, we're at one sixteen, so I think some people may have to to run. But Mark, this has been ter terrific. Uh, lots of interesting uh, examples, and I think for those of anyone who has to leave because our time is up, please feel free to leave. But if anyone wants to stay on, uh, and you know, I ask Mark to comment on uh, any aspect. We can certainly do that for a few minutes. Mark, is that okay? Yeah, I today was a snow day for me. <laughs> okay. Nothing else uh, on nothing else. 